far from congregation to congregation, and on our final ride home on the train from up near Brainerd down to Minneapolis, I had instructed the girls to be very quiet and dignified and ladylike on the train not to upset. I said, you know, your responsibility for the reputation of Augsburg, it just simply is up to you people. And after we had been on the train for a half an hour or so, a woman came up to me and she said, I'm Mrs. Clarence Framstead. And I just, I recognize you now. I saw this gang of girls coming on the train and I thought, we're really going to have a noisy ride into Minneapolis at this point. But she said, I want to compliment you on the very fine sort of manner in which your girls appear. Well, we came back to Minneapolis, and the young men all met the girls, and they had dates that night, I suppose, and so on, and everybody talked about this. But the grand payoff was the fact that we had a $500 balance from our first choral club tour, and the men's glee club had an indebtedness on the grand piano in the chapel of $500. So the girls helped the men pay for the balance of that first grand piano. Well, that was the way the choral club started. They kept up having a choral club and a choir until around 1933, 34, when they merged into a choir. There was a great deal of feeling about that we should still keep separate organizations, but Mr. Saturn, who had succeeded Mr. Upseth, was much interested in having a choir. So we had a choir composed of the women of the choral club and the men's glee club. And then uh, Mr., I think Donald Mervick was director of that when Leland Saturn came back to service after the war. And he picked up the second choir, which was then called the Choral Club, but that was also a mixed choir. So they started out with mixed choir music at this point. And we've had these groups going and much music going since. But one of the very wonderful things about music at Augsburg College is that we have been in this metropolitan community where the arts have been coming from the beginning of the Minneapolis Symphony under the leadership of Emo Oberhofer playing in the old Lyceum downtown Minneapolis on 11th Street. As an undergraduate student at University of Minnesota, I remember very well the first concert I went to to hear Oberhofer play direct. And I had heard symphonies and this, but I had not heard tone poems. And every time subsequent years when I go to hear the Minneapolis Symphony, they play the Pines of Rome or the Fountains of Rome. My mind goes back to that concert and there was a Debussy number and I'd never heard Debussy before. I think they played the sea, the mare, is that it? Mm -hmm. And I just simply, I was speechless with the beauty of the music and the loveliness of this. And I thought, oh, this is what I want to be doing. Well, I want to go to here. Well, I had taken piano lessons from Rangna Sverdrup, the very delightful treasurer of Augsburg College, who was a sister of George Sverdrup. She had graduated from the uh, Minneapolis School of Music and was a very able musician herself, had given some piano lessons, but because of uh, uh, problems with the curvature of the spine, she had found it very difficult to sit and play piano. So she had accepted this position, the treasurer of Augsburg, which she did with utmost beauty and dignity, and she added something that was just very fine. But she had also taught piano to Jenny Skirtleswold, who was teaching voice at Augsburg at the time that I came and her sister Sigrid, who was dietitian at Deaconess and who was organist at Trinity Lutheran Church for a period of 35 or 40 years. Well, the four of us decided that we would buy season tickets for the Minneapolis Symphony concerts. So for years, we went downtown to the old Lyceum. We bought the cheapest tickets. We oftentimes walked, because Rangna was a good walker. And then we would talk over the music so I learned music by listening to music. I didn't know I had never formally studied music. But the thing just simply grew and grew. Then Oberhofer left. And what was the name? Verbruggen came. And we certainly got sort of tired of Verbruggen and Jenny, that uh, piano violinist that he had. And then all at once, one day, it was announced that we were going to have Eugene Armandy as director. 
he played, directed our Friday evening concert, and I was so excited, and there was going to be an all Tchaikovsky program on Sunday. I immediately went to the box office and bought tickets for my whole family for the Sunday afternoon concert and took everybody over there, including Elizabeth, who was just a little, little girl. But we sat and listened to the magnificent music that he was able to bring out of that orchestra. He wasn't there many years, and then he was succeeded by Dmitri Metropolis. And we thought that we'd had the pinnacle with Armandy. But when this tall Athenian strode to the podium and directed this symphony, it was as though it were all electrified over again. And I remember that opening concert. He did a piano concerto with the orchestra and directed with his head and sat and played and directed. And oh, we just thought, no. So we kept going year in and year out. This was the Friday evening routine, listening to all this grand music. And then about in 1954, we were approached by a subcommittee of the Minneapolis Symphony in their interest to try to bring uh, the uh, colleges to uh, uh, and more young people to attend the symphony orchestra concerts, they were starting something that they called symphony forums. And they wanted to do a pilot study with Augsburg College. Claire Stillman, I think, was in the director of public relations at that time, and he referred Stanley Hawks and one Mr. Lund and one Mr. Zelly to me. So we sat down to talk about what we might do. Uh, it happened that my niece Elizabeth Mortensen, who was a major in music, was chairman of music that year. So I called her in, and together we sat down to talk about what we could do about selling tickets at a reduced rate to Augsburg College students and to Augsburg faculty, and then three or two or three times a year, we would have the artists from the university come over to meet with us. This just challenged everybody's interest. And that first year, two-thirds of our faculty and students bought this series of concert tickets. And this was an amazing sort of thing. And in the program notes, of that opening concert, it talks about uh, Elizabeth Mortensen as chairman of this committee and that they had now established symphony forums at Augsburg College. Mm -hmm. We arranged a uh, dinner for all these people, faculty and students, and anyone else who would like to come. And we were around 200 people in the old dining room, and Aunt Alderati came over to talk to the group. And he talked about what what constitutes listening to music? Mm. How do you listen to music? And how does a symphony operate? And how does a symphony work? At the end of the evening, we felt as if we had been at some renewed spiritual heights. Anybody who had a deep interest in, in religion and spirituality felt that they had been tremendously ennobled by this experience. We have some pictures in the family and in the archives of Dorati being there, and uh, I know Elizabeth has one that she cherishes highly, taken with Dorati because she had done this. We uh, also had the privilege of having Isaac Stern come over to Augsburg one evening to talk to the symphony. We decided it was better to have a uh, symphony forum the evening before the concert so that people could come and meet this person and then talk with them. Isaac Stern is always very willing to do this kind of thing and was quite articulate. He brought his very charming wife with him. We were all ready for this down in the student lounge of uh, Science Hall when all at once electric storm came on and the lights went out. Well, Gerda knew where some candles were in the home economics department and some candlesticks. So she scrounged around and found all kinds of candles and candlesticks. And that little old, that little, not old, but that, uh, that student lounge was just sort of delightful. And we set somebody at the door to meet the people with the candle and to light the path down. 
it just set such a sort of a romantic kind of yeah, setting. And uh, hmm. Mr. Um, oh, the business manager of the uh, Minneapolis Symphony. Uh, yeah, yes. uh, what was his name at that time? Who was the leader of the Oh, I'll think of his name a little later. But he escorted uh, Mr. and Mrs. Isaac Stern, and they came on down. I don't remember now whether... I wonder if there was a Mr. Lund and this Mr. Zelly, and I think that they were there with us. At the dinner when Dravati was there, Donald Dayton was present because he was on this board to try to interest young people in symphony concerts. But, of course, the fact that we had done such a superb job of selling to such a large number of people was a tremendous incentive to these people, and subsequently they extended this service to all the colleges and bus loads used to come from Carleton and St. Olaf and Gustavus mm -hmm. Adolphus and from St. Catharines and all. But they always said, you people did the superb beginning job. Mm -hmm. And and then the next year, uh, Dorati came back again. And he talked about his own bringing up in Hungary and about listening to music. And he, and he talked about Bartok because he would, Bella Bartok was one of his favorites. And he talked about how, as you grew up in, in Hungary, you just grew up with music as though you were eating the soil and the spirit and the soul of the country. Well, our students who were there and listened to these just never forgot these things. And uh, other years, we followed up and tried to get some people to come over. But uh, then there got to be competition to go to the Masterpiece Series and some other kind of things. And the Minneapolis Symphony has changed so that they offer now two smaller series and within these, and students still may buy tickets at discount. And we did, in those early days, also have quite a few students who ushered at the symphony. They had ushered downtown, and they ushered over at the Minneapolis Symphony, but then the music students at the University of Minnesota got first chance, and so there are less of them. But if they really wanted to and didn't have money to buy tickets, then they could also, you know, make an effort, and several of them did to get there. And now we have Skrovachevsky, and as our upcoming uh, centennial year, we are scheduled for the 19th of October to have the Minneapolis Symphony play a centennial concert, the uh, original premiere of uh, Knut Nystedt of Oslo, Norway's work, for Augs written for Augsburg College Choir, with the music for the by the Minneapolis Symphony. The symphony will also want to play something else. They will play something Mozart, which relates to Mozart, whose home was in Augsburg, Germany, paying tribute to that connection. And also, uh, they will play something that they are already acquainted with. And so we're going to ask Mr. James Johnson, the music department at Augsburg, who has done the Greek concerto with the Minneapolis Symphony and a concert at our place to do this at the university. Those were somehow the beginnings of some of all of this. Now I'm talking about the University of Minnesota. We were just across the river. Anybody could walk over. All the concerts, all the programs, all the lectures, all the workshops, all the drama, they were open to us. And faculty people at Augsburg were always interested in buying tickets, getting tickets, encouraging students to go. And so we have some of all of this. We tried to think, too, that there were some needs in our community as we wanted to reach out into the community to do something. And so uh, one year, a number of us thought it would be a very wonderful th thing if at Christmas time each year we could bring members of all the different churches in, in Minneapolis together to the Minneapolis Auditorium to have a Christmas carol sing. Couldn't we start a create a new tradition to do something like this? Well, I think we did it about three years, and we had quite a large number of people coming. But then I think that with uh, Claire Strummond's coming to be in the public relations office, he didn't quite see the value of this. He didn't think it would be a going thing. And so uh, this idea was dropped, only to be picked up by the Lutheran Welfare Society using uh, Luther College Choir at Decorah, Iowa, as the uh, focal point and its director to put on the Messiah every year at, uh, Advent, on Advent Sunday. This continued for many, many years. 
and many of the Augsburg choir people, anybody who liked to sing could go and join the big mass choir that sang for the Messiah. I suppose the year that this Messiah stood out as the greatest rendition was the year that Jenny Skirtlesvall sang the alto solo and John Toot, whom Mr. Saturn described as the best tenor in the Twin Cities, sang the tenor solos. Ross Hushler from the University of Minnesota, the bass, and I've forgotten now who the year soprano was. But our we were just as proud as we could be of Jenny Skirtlesvall and John Toot because they had done such absolutely excellent work. Our choirs took tours east and west and north and south. And uh, we had a band that had been started in 1952 when Mayo Savold came to Augsburg. He had directed MacArthur's band in the South Pacific during the war period, and he came to us much interested in doing something with the band. I was in charge of freshman week that year, and as I met him in the hallway, I needed to go to the bank. Oh, he said, let me take you down to the bank. And on the way, we talked about what could we do to build up a, a number of people who would like to be in the band. So we decided we would write to all the freshmen, everybody to take any instrument along that they played and bring them with them and take them out to freshman camp. And so this we did. And out of that group, there were some 70, 80 students who brought their instruments along. And Mayo Savold had the electric quality of being able to bring out the best in these youngsters. And they played, so much, had so much fun rehearsing then. And it was a nucleus of a band which grew and grew and grew from then. Until now, he has a highly selective band. He has a second band. He has a repertoire uh, concert class where people just simply get acquainted with a great deal of the music. Uh, the band has played for national conventions downtown. And at one of these national conventions meeting in Minneapolis, he met some people from England and from Europe, other places who were attending. And he invited them to come to attend what was known for a number of years as the Spring Antiphony at Augsburg College, which was a creative use of music, art, drama, and speech. Uh, taking, and this was always the second Sunday before Palm Sunday. Was it first or second? Well, anyway, it was before preceding Palm Sunday. But we took the whole idea of Spring Antiphony as some creative way to express our own feeling about um, Easter, about resurrection, about eternal life. And as these people that Mayo had invited to come from that national convention walked out of Simon Hall, where that first Antiphony was given, I overheard somebody say, this is the most creative thing that I've seen in the line of music in all of USA. This reminds me of a story that Mr. Fossey, our chemistry professor, told one time as he gave a chapel talk. How are you going to learn how to appreciate good music? Now, Mr. Fossey was raised in uh, the area of South Dakota, uh, about the area where Rolvog's book, Giants in the Earth, had uh, its setting. His family situation was such that he was not able to go to high school until he was something like 15, 16, 17 years of age. And so I think in two years, he studied everything in high school and was ready to go on to college. In his home community, there was a dear old country fiddler, and he played the <coughs> fiddle. And he thought there was just no music quite like the country fiddler. So when he went to college, I don't remember where this was, but anyway, he was always told that he should go and listen to some other music and expand his interest and concept of what music was. So he did go, and he went to hear concerts, and he went to hear recitals, and he went to hear symphonies. But all the time, his thought went back to that country fiddler. No music really came up to what that country fiddler was. And after he graduated, he went back to his home community one time, and lo and behold, the country fiddler was to play. 
And lo and behold, he said, I discovered what I had learned. And I had learned it by going to listen and listen and listen. And imperceptibly, I had grown. Mm -hmm. And I suddenly realized that the symphony music and the beauty of all of this, this was what my soul really wanted. Mm -hmm. And so it is also in the field of literature, he said. <coughs> Some people write books about flowery front yards, and they're so flowery that they're just too heavy with perfume. Mm -hmm. And some describe the backyard so you see every pig and every bit of filth there ever is. You don't need to see all the beauty. You don't need to see all the filth. You can find things that will talk about things. And, and there can be something which is a happy medium between the two. And something which is real and true and significant. And this is what's great literature. So you can develop a capacity for great literature and a capacity for great music and a feeling that you have for art mm -hmm. and for drama by exposing yourself to these things enough times until somehow th by the process of osmosis they've gotten into you and they're part of your woven web of your being. That was, I've just never forgotten that little talk by Mr. Fossey. <laughs>